Hello from Heirloom Books at 6239 North Clark Street, Chicago, Illinois. I'm Jeff Helgeson. Just after the beginning of the American Civil War in 1861, when commerce on the Mississippi River was interrupted, a 26-year-old riverboat pilot named Sam, who'd only had a fifth grade education, although he'd previously worked as a printer, briefly enlisted in a band of irregular Confederate volunteers, but then resigned after two weeks in order to join his older brother, Oren, in Nevada. There, he unsuccessfully prospected for silver, drank heavily, and began writing for local newspapers, publishing under a number of assumed names, such as simply Josh, or Thomas Jefferson Snodgrass, and even W. Epaminidas Adorastus, before settling for a more permanent pen name and lifetime persona, derived from his steamboat experience, a term meaning a safe depth of water for riverboats of 12 feet, or two fathoms, Mark Twain. In San Francisco, he met such other writers as Bret Hart, the author of the short story, The Outcast of Poker Flat, and Artemis Ward. By this time in his life, Samuel Langhorne Clements had already traveled from his hometown of Hannibal, Missouri, to work as a typesetter in St. Louis, New York City, Philadelphia, and New Orleans with plans to continue on to South America before becoming an apprentice riverboat pilot instead. Eventually working on at least a dozen different boats, Sam also, tragically as it turned out, found a place for his younger brother Henry on a side wheeler called the Pennsylvania, where he was killed in a boiler explosion near Memphis, Tennessee in 1858. Seven years later, on December 16, 1865, a New York publication, the Saturday Press, included a humorous short story written in vernacular dialect as a letter to Artemis Ward titled, Jim Smiley and His Jumping Frog. It subsequently appeared in newspapers throughout the country and made Mark Twain a national celebrity. Two years following that, with its title modified a bit, this story became the basis of Twain's first book, The Celebrated Jumping Frog of Calaveras County and Other Sketches. Then, <clears throat> at around the time the United States had been purchasing Alaska from Russia for $7.2 million, Mark Twain started on a journey which became the basis for his next publication, The Innocents Abroad, or The New Pilgrim's Progress, being some account of the steamship Quaker City's pleasure excursion to Europe and the Holy Land. Within it, Twain observed that everything he saw during his travels looked worn out and as far as I can see, Italy, for 1,500 years, has turned all her energies, all her finances, and all her industry to building up a vast array of wonderful church edifices and starving half her citizens to accomplish it. Then, he further observed about the uh, Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem, History is full of blood that was shed because of the respect and veneration in which men held the last resting place of the meek and lowly, mild and gentle Prince of Peace. In 1867, Sam Clemens claimed to have fallen in love at first sight 
with a successful businessman's daughter from Elmira, New York, named Olivia Langdon. Beginning to lecture widely under his pen name throughout the eastern and midwestern United States, and with his prospective father-in-law's financial assistance, he acquired a third interest in the Buffalo New York Express and bought a home in that city, marrying his intended. But after a year in Buffalo and following the premature birth of a son, the author sold his share in the newspaper and the house, relocating his family to a large home he had built in Hartford, Connecticut. A year later, a daughter named Susan, Olivia Susan, Susie, was born just four months before her brother died. While living in Hartford, having met through his wife's family such prominent individuals as the escaped slave and abolitionist Frederick Douglass and the author of Uncle Tom's Cabin, Harriet Beecher Stowe, who was supposed to have been described by then President Abraham Lincoln as the little woman who started the Civil War and whose home was next door to the large house Mr. Clemens had built. Twain began a collaboration with Charles Dudley Werner, a local journalist, on a novel titled The uh, Gilded Age. Like with the work of James Fenimore Cooper undertaken some half a century earlier, and who Twain once accused of about 114 violations of the laws of literary art out of a possible 115, this book had been inspired by a challenge from the two men's wives to write something better than the popular fiction of the day, such as Louisa May Alcott's Little Women and Little Men. The novel they responded with was written in about three months, addressing itself to the greed and corruption of post-Civil War America by focusing largely on unethical real estate speculation and some questions of voter fraud, things that seem to remain time-honored traditions within American culture and politics. Following this undertaking, Twain looked back to his youth in Hannibal, Missouri for his next work, The Adventures of Tom Sawyer. It became an immediate success and has never been out of print since its first publication in 1876. In my mind, at any rate, the story of Tom and Becky Thatcher, Aunt Polly, Injun Joe, and Huck Finn is far more about the universal experience of adolescence than any of the specific fence painting tricks or particular encounters represented within it. As Twain himself stated in the book's preface, Part of my plan has been to try and pleasantly remind adults of what they once were themselves and of how they felt and thought and talked and what queer enterprises they sometimes engaged in. Further, looking back to his youth, as he had done as a boy in his uncle's farm near Florida, Missouri, the writer's family began spending summers on Olivia's sister's quarry farm near Elmira, New York. Apparently, in order to get constant cigar smoking out of her house, his sister-in-law had a writer's shed built for him, and it was there that Tom Sawyer, The Prince and the Pauper, Life on the Mississippi, a Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court, and the book both Ernest Hemingway and William Faulkner have described as the foundation of all American literature, The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, 
were each written. Returning to the use of vernacular dialect, Twain also began Huckleberry Finn with a disclaimer, stating, Persons attempting to find a motive in this narrative will be prosecuted. Persons attempting to find a moral in it will be banished. Persons attempting to find a plot in it will be shot. The rest of the book is supposedly written by its central character who explains, You don't know about me without you have read a book by the name of The Adventures of Tom Sawyer. That ain't no matter. That book was made by Mr. Mark Twain, and he told the truth, mainly. There was some things he stretched, but mainly he told the truth. That is nothing. I never seen nobody but lied one time or another. And with that, Huck begins the story of how he had been taken in by the widow Douglas after his adventure with Tom and the horde of robbers gold that they had acquired, was kidnapped by his drunken father, faked his own murder, and then went to a small island in the river where he met a slave named Jim, who had run away from the widow's sister, Miss Watson, in order to escape the fate of being sold down the river to a plantation in the Deep South. Together, Huck and Jim start out on a raft towards where the Mississippi meets the Ohio River at Cairo, Illinois, from which the runaway hopes to head north into a free state so he can work in order to earn the money to buy his wife and children. The uh, real journey, of course, is the one of moral discovery that Huck embarks upon, learning as he goes about the true nature of human compassion. Along the way, Huck lies to protect Jim from slave hunters, encounters lessons of conscience and humility, and observes It's lovely to live on a raft. We had the sky up there, all speckled with stars, and we used to lay on our backs and look up at them and discuss about whether they was made or only just happened. Jim, he allowed they was made. But I allowed they happened. I judged it would have took too long to make so many. Jim said, the moon could have laid him. Well, that looked kind of reasonable. So I didn't say nothing against it. Because I've seen a frog lay almost as many. So of course, it could have been done. Running across a pair of shyster scallywags who'd been escaping being tarred and feathered by some town folks they had tried to scam, the pair join Huck and Jim claiming to be the Duke of Bridgewater and the French Dauphin, heir to the throne of Louis XVI. More events unfold, including a revival performance by the uh, sham royalty of the immortal soliloquy from Hamlet. To be or not to be, that is the bare bodkin that makes calamity a so long life. For who would fardels bear till Burnham would do come to Dunsinane? And finally, there is the deep moral reckoning when Huck writes to Miss Watson telling her where to find her runaway slave. But then, even though 
helping Jim was essentially stealing another person's property, and stealing was a mortal sin. After recalling the care and devotion that they had shared on the river, Huck declares, All right then, I'll go to hell. Tears up the letter and starts back to free his friend, like Grant took Vicksburg, declaring his own Emancipation Proclamation before ultimately deciding to uh, light out for the territory ahead of the rest, before Tom Sawyer's Aunt Sally could adopt and try to civilize him because he had been there before. The same year that The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn was published, 1885, under the name of his wife's nephew, Samuel L. Clemens founded a publishing company that successfully brought out the memoirs of Ulysses S. Grant. He'd also become financially invested in the development of a typesetting machine that could have made him extremely wealthy, if it had worked. But it didn't. And then the publishing firm went bankrupt, forcing Mark Twain to undertake a worldwide speaking tour in order to pay off his debts, which he succeeded in doing while writing and releasing The Tragedy of Puddinghead Wilson and Personal Recollections of Joan of Arc, in addition to Following the Equator. He had been living in Vienna and taking his wife to various European spa locations because of chronic arthritis in her spine, when their 24-year-old daughter, Susie, back in Hartford, died of meningitis in 1896. And another daughter, Jean, was diagnosed with epilepsy. Then, having returned to Europe, while in Florence on June 5th, 1904, his wife passed away from heart failure and his daughter Clara experienced a nervous breakdown. All of this, perhaps naturally enough, seems to have affected the tone in which works such as The Man That Corrupted Hadleyburg and The Mysterious Stranger, ending with the assertion made by Satan, There is no God, no universe, no heaven, no hell. It is all a dream, a grotesque and foolish dream. Nothing exists but you, and you are but a thought, a vagrant thought, a useless thought, a homeless thought, wandering forlorn among the empty eternities. Within Mark Twain's posthumously released works, um, Letters from the Earth, published in 1962, and the uh, autobiography that he transcribed between 1870 and 1905, stipulating that it not be published until a full century after his death. America's leading humorist expressed his sense of things as he saw them. Among the um, observations that Twain had Satan offer in his correspondence from the earth to his fellow angels back in heaven, Gabriel and Michael, is the assertion that the law of nature is ferocity. And that natural law is the law of God, assuring the nourishment of such things as typhoid germs and cholera germs and lockjaw germs and consumption germs and black 
plague, germs, and some other aristocrats, specially precious creations, golden bearers of God's love to man. On Christmas Eve in 1909, the writer's daughter Jean died and was interred beneath a marker inscribed with the words, her desolate father lays this stone. Four months later, on April 21st, 1910, Mark Twain himself passed away, but his legacy certainly did not. With over 45 motion picture and television adaptations of his works, as well as numerous documentaries about his life, including the um, two and a half hour 2002 public broadcast film directed by Ken Burns, not to mention countless newspaper articles, and almost a century after his death, full issues of both Time and Newsweek dedicated to his literary legacy. Now, well over a century after Mark Twain's demise, it would still seem that rumors of his death are somewhat exaggerated. Just the one-liners uh, that are attributed to him have served to maintain his role as a central part of American consciousness. Statements like, Wisdom comes from experience. But experience comes from poor judgment. A clear conscience is a sure sign of a bad memory. Never let schooling interfere with education. Man is the only animal that blushes, or has occasion to. It is better to keep your mouth closed and let people think you are a fool, than to open it and remove all doubt. Do the right thing. It will gratify some people and astonish the rest. The lack of money is the root of all evil. Go to heaven for the climate, hell for the company. Man is the only animal that has the true religion. Several of them, in fact. Politicians and diapers must be changed often, and for the same reason. Loyalty to country always. Loyalty to government only when it deserves it, and well, perhaps including reference to his own work. A classic is a book that people praise but do not read. I'm Jeff Helgeson. Heirloom Books is located at 6239 North Clark Street in Chicago, Illinois.